Now they say the measure of a leader is what happens when you're away, not when you're here, right, looking. And I tell you, I am so impressed with the volunteers at this church. Wow, you guys rock, man. I walked in here at 9 o'clock and everybody was already ready. You know, greeting people, the tech team was ready, the music team was practicing, everything was good. All right? And uh, you're an awesome body of believers, and I'm so glad to be here uh, amongst you. All right, now, this is a sermon that, uh, that might bring more questions than it brings answers. All right, now, I've struggled with actually preaching this message because it wasn't but the second last time that I preached here that I preached on the very same subject. And uh, it's just a different version that the Lord has really laid on my heart. And if you have a, a lot of questions at the end, which you probably will have, and you say, John, what about this, and what about that, and what about that situation? Well, it'd be awesome if the result of this would be you would go home and ask God about them and search uh, His Holy Word to find out what the answer is. But I'm going to take the risk this morning, because uh, it really burdened my heart to speak about this, and I just ask for your grace, and if you find yourself resisting a little bit, that's okay. I resist a lot to my own sermon. You know, this is one of those sermons where I don't practice what I preached, or what I'm going to preach. I want to, but I'm not there yet. And so I tell you, this sermon is way more about the struggles in my heart than anybody here. So I'm not preaching about anyone or any group of people or whatever. I'm preaching what is going on in my heart, and, uh, and I want to be released from it, and I think Jesus has the answer to all of our issues, and uh, hopefully uh, you will find some refreshment and release from this today as well. And so I want to start by reflecting on last week where Pastor Kendall said something like this, that I love Jesus, or people say, he's heard people say, I love Jesus, but I, I don't like the church. Meaning the people. You know, I was a pastor for 20 years, and I used to say that when I was the pastor, they'd ask, well, how's your church going? I'd say, well, the church is awesome if it wasn't for the people. You know, and it's like, whoa, there's something wrong with that statement, right? There's something very wrong with it. You know, and it's like, uh, if we love Jesus, if we truly love Jesus, then we're going to love what he loves, right? And uh, if he loves people, and if he loves the church, and he gave himself for it, then we should love what he loves. And perhaps if we don't love what he loves, then perhaps we don't love Jesus, as we should. And, uh, and so that's kind of challenging. But, um, you know, the problem is that, that people are imperfect. Jesus is perfect to say, well, he's easy to love. I mean, what's there not to love about Jesus? He gives himself for you. Die on the cross for all the incredible blessings that we have. And he's done that for us. But what about people? They're imperfect. And, and their imperfections are things that can offend us. You know, we can, we can be embarrassed. We can be insulted. We can even be abused by other people's imperfections. And let's face it, some people are hard to not be offended by. You know, and, and, and that would be the case with me, you know, and so everything's imperfect, and even our interaction, my interaction, the way I started the service, the way the, 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 the team sang this morning, whoever greeted you at the door, it was imperfect. There was nothing perfect about it, and so imperfection is everywhere. And Jesus knows that we're all imperfect. He absolutely knows, but he still asks us to do this. He still asks us to love one another. He still connects us in unity into the body of Christ. Jesus died that we may be one. And uh, not only are we to exist and, and, you know, together, but we're actually supposed to love and serve each other sacrificially. And so I would think that there'd be a special sauce that we all need in order for that to happen, don't you think? I think there's a special ingredient that God wants to give us. He wants us to have it. Perhaps above all things, He wants us to have this thing because it's necessary to go exist in the body and in service to one another and to be the image of Christ to the world that we're supposed to be, but also every kind of, every relationship, every relationship to work well needs this ingredient. And perhaps some of your relationships are not working very well right now, and, and maybe it's because of that. But not only that, this thing releases a lot of anxiety. You know, we, we all want rest, we all want peace. The world is filled with anxiety, I mean, I mean, 
Millions, yeah. 75 million people apparently in America are going for anxiety meds or something like that. I mean, the world is filled with anxiety and we need to come to a place of rest. And if we as Christians can't come to a place of rest, then what do we have? What do we have to offer? And I believe that this, today, what we're going to speak about brings you to uh, that place of rest in your soul. And so I want to start off with a confession this morning, and that is this, that uh, I have been challenged uh, by my prayer life, my prayer life. Let's say my prayer life has been very challenging to me. I don't know, anybody else have that issue? <laughs> you know, you wish you could pray better, and most of the time my default is to focus on me. You know, it's like, oh, I'm tired at the end of the day. Lord, just please bless me, please bless me, please bless my people. You know, and please keep me safe, and Lord, just bring stuff, you know, that I need, and so on. And, and, and that's what it degenerates down to, which being interpreted means, Lord, just make my life more comfortable, please, and help me on my journey to the American dream of, of, of absolute financial autonomy. I mean, I mean, after all, isn't that what God wants? And, uh, you know, after a while, it gets old to just keep praying like that. And it becomes unfulfilling, and I, I actually became embarrassed by my own prayers, and I couldn't imagine God listening to them over and over again, you know, you know like a pesky child in this supermarket, in the store, that every aisle is asking his mom, Mom, buy me this, oh, buy me, give me that, you know, and oh, look at that, oh, look at that sweet, you know, it's like, hmm. And I started to think, God must have a lot of grace, <laughs> And he does, fortunately, but he doesn't want us to stay there. There's a better way to pray, don't you think? There's a better way to, play, to pray. And so lately in my journey, uh, you know, I've been discovering perhaps a better way to prayer. And I told somebody at the beginning, this is, a, this is a sermon that is directed at me because this is a learning curve I'm on. You'd think, you know, after I don't know how many years, 57 years, of walking with the Lord, that I might have learned this before. But, you know, what I've been doing is praying the Lord's Prayer. I've been praying the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, you know, some may say, well, that's just rote liturgy, or, you know, maybe it's an example for us to pray by, you know, what subject matter is the right thing to pray about. Well, I think it's absolutely both. Why wouldn't God want us to do both? And if you haven't got anything better to pray, start to pray the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, well, let me, let me pray the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, I, don't want to, I want to prevent my prayer life to be all about me and mine and mine and plea for blessing, you know. And I want to start praying the Lord's Prayer every single night. So I started to pray for the Lord, through the Lord's Prayer every now, night as I knelt by my bedside. And sometimes it's all I prayed, but other times it was a preamble to a longer prayer, but it set the tone. And it became a very profound exercise for me. And over time, each line became more and more important. I just saw the richness of this prayer. Man, it's got everything. It is everything inside this prayer. And so I want to say it together. Can we say it together this morning responsibly? That means I'm going to say a little phrase and then you repeat after me. And that way we stay together a little better. All right, so on the screen, here's the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Now why do we call it the Lord's Prayer? Is it because this is the prayer that the Lord prayed all the time? No, I don't think so, because there are things in the prayer that he wouldn't have prayed. For example, he had no sin, so why would he pray for the forgiveness of sin? So this is more about a prayer that is given to us, that is a gift from him to pray. You know, and I thought, wow, it's amazing. And it really, it contains the essence of what Jesus wants us to pray. And we know these days, uh, because we have a whole New Testament, is that uh, Jesus is our advocate. He's our high priest. He actually takes our prayers, and we pray through him to the Father. 
And so he takes our prayers and presents them to the Father. Now, if that means that this is, this is an incredible treasure that God has given us, an incredible treasure that Jesus has given us. Because can you imagine uh, this situation where you want something from a very influential person? You have a very rich person, a very powerful person, and you desperately need something from this person. And you knew his son, and his, and his son came to you and said, you know what, you want, I know how you can get to the heart of my father for him to give you that stuff that you need. I know. You just take this approach, and you talk about these things, and then, wow, I think my father is going to respond positively to, to you. Now, would you listen to the son? You absolutely would. You'd be foolish not to listen to what that son, and take what the son says and present it to the father, right? And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. The son of God is giving us an incredible treasure, a gift to us. He said, listen, this is the way to get to my father. These are the words. These are the things my father wants to, wants to hear. And as I said at the beginning, this is actually a place to find rest. You know, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And Becky actually quoted that this morning. Wasn't Becky and the team awesome this morning? Yeah, man. I love that. But she talked about people being heavy laden, and that's what Jesus said. And you are heavy laden, but you need to come to me to find rest. And the way to find rest is to learn of me. That's what he says. Learn from me. I tell you, you know, this is, this is a learning point because Jesus is very clear. Look what it says in the beginning of verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6. He says, this then is how you should pray. And perhaps if you're filled with anxiety and we don't have rest in our lives, it's because perhaps we're not praying right. And Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Now you, you'd have to do a lot of theological gymnastics to confuse that, wouldn't you? That is clear. That is clear as night, as day, I mean, right? This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us a day your daily bread. That's the first half of the prayer. And uh, is, these are all key facets of our relationship with God. You know, Jesus really focuses on some amazing things. And actually, each one of those phrases is a whole sermon. I think maybe Pastor Kendall did a sermon series on this one where he's focused just on each phrase. It's incredible. You know, our Father in heaven, there's a, there's a whole sermon there. Hallowed be your name, the reverence, the awe of our Father's name and the power behind it. Your kingdom come. And what does the kingdom look like and where is it going and when will it be established finally on the earth and all that. There's a huge sermons in each of these. Give us today your daily bread. Man, wow, just total dependence upon him moment by moment. These are things we should live by. They should be at the forefront of our minds. They were what Jesus lived by, and they should be the same things that we live by. And so, that's incredible. So the first part is all about the kingdom. It starts with the kingdom. And then it ends with the kingdom, right? Where he says, for yours is the kingdom, and the power and the glory. So we've got kingdom at the beginning, kingdom at the end. This is a kingdom prayer. We all want to experience the kingdom of God. We want to live in the riches of his kingdom, don't we? And so, What's in the middle? Well, there's this verse. Verse 12. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. Wow. That's the meat in the sandwich. All right, you've got the kingdom on the one side, the kingdom on the other. What's in the middle? Forgiveness. Could this be the backbone of the kingdom, that the essence of the kingdom of God is forgiveness. Of course, we love the first piece, oh God, forgive me my sins. We all want to have our sins forgiven. We love that idea. We don't want to go to eternal you know, hell. We don't want to be apart from God. We want all the blessings God is going to give us. So Lord, don't let anything stand in the way between me and you. Lord, please forgive my sins. But then he continues, as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. And that's not a plea for help. It's like, oh Lord, help us. You know we're really bad at this. And just help us to forgive others. But you know, it's really difficult. No, this is a statement of fact. It's a statement of fact as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. It's what we do. In other words, 
If you receive the forgiveness of sins, then you also forgive others. They're like swimming in water. You know, they go together. They have to go together. And so it is. If you receive the forgiveness of sins, you also need to forgive others. Now, in case we didn't get the message, Jesus immediately, right after he finishes this prayer, makes sure that we get this message because he gives us two verses, a commentary, where without skipping a beat, he immediately comments on the prayer that he made. And you know, he could have focused on, on so many things, and, and he didn't. He zeroed in on this one thing, and what he said was absolutely shocking. It is shocking. It shocks boots out of me every time I read this. I just try to skip over it every time I read this chapter. And I looked to see if these verses were in the original. You know? Because I didn't want to hear it. So what did he say? He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive their sins. Just in case you skip over that piece about forgiveness, you know, the piece right in the middle of my prayer, let me, let me remind you, let me focus your attention back on this. This is, this is a serious warning that Jesus has given us, and he emphasizes that this is the meat and the sandwich of the kingdom. And he says, if we don't pardon other people, you know, our Heavenly Father may not pardon us. Now let me be clear about this. I don't believe this means that a believer can lose their relationship with their Heavenly Father. I don't believe that. You know? I don't believe that a believer can lose their salvation. As if, you know, if he's bearing, you know, he dies and he's still bearing a little bit of a grudge against somebody, that that's the end for him and God is going to banish him. You know, from his presence, no, I don't believe that because there are too many other parts of Jesus' teaching that don't tie up with that. And the apostolic teaching, I think, is very clear that our salvation is secure in the Lord. But what I believe it absolutely does mean is he's speaking uh, to his disciples and drawing an, an analogy between the heavenly family and the earthly family. And, uh, and there's an analogy there, and there's like the parent-child relationship that we have here on earth is not broken because the child becomes unforgiving. You know, right? it changes, but I'm still father of a son or a daughter. You know, that relationship does not change. And God is still our father. But what does change is the tenor of the relationship. The way in which the relationship is conducted may change as a result of us having an unforgiving attitude, and we're definitely not in sync so let's not lose the main emphasis here. This is not about your salvation. I don't believe that. But what is true is that we'll never enter into the riches of his, of his kingdom. We'll never enter the fullness of relationship with our Heavenly Father if we do not forgive others as He has also forgiven, forgiven us. And the relationship may change and move towards discipline and other consequences. Right? When we're not in sync with our Heavenly Father in the same way as perhaps it does in the earthly realm, we never lose that He's our Father. The prayer started, our Father, and that, that doesn't change. But what may change is the way you relate to Him and your enjoyment of what He wants to do to you, to bring you. And so Jesus could have focused on anything. He could have focused on the incredible glory of the Father and how his name is to be revered. He could have focused on his kingdom coming and all that entailed. He could have focused on the wonder of his daily provision, and we were all being so excited. Yeah! But he didn't. He focused on this whole thing of forgiveness. And this is what I believe the Lord is inviting us to today. And it's, here's a, a phrase on the screen that sums it up. The Lord is inviting us to a place where our default response Say default. Where our default response to people, all people, is forgiveness. And that's hard, right? That's really, really hard. But Jesus never asked us to do something he didn't show us how to do. That's why we love Jesus so much. And Jesus lived this and showed us absolutely to perfection how this is done. 
Can you imagine right now Jesus on the cross? There he is, surrounded by abusive, arrogant, horrible people. You know, they're cursing him, they're insulting him, they're stabbing him with a spear, they're piercing his head with thorns, they're destroying the innocent body of Christ, they're doing all that, they treated him like a disgusting criminal, they chose another obvious thug called Barabbas in his place so that Jesus would be crucified and not this guy. I mean, here they are. And it's a horrible scene, it's the worst scene of all history. And in the moment, in that moment, Jesus did not pray to his father and say, listen, uh, let's, let's declare justice right now. Let's, let's make a declaration of who is right and who is wrong here. So, Heavenly Father, speak and bring your angels and let's sort this out once and for all. And if Jesus had done that, we would have, we would have forgiven him because it just seems so right for him to do that. But he doesn't. Out of his tortured, swollen, bleeding lips, he says these incredible words. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they should have known. They should have known exactly what they were doing because they had seen him. They had heard so much about him but they were blinded. They marveled at his teachings. They had seen his provision of food for the hungry, his power over the storms. They'd seen complete recovery of their, their friends and their relatives, you know, from, from lameness and from blindness and from deafness. They'd seen the deliverance of demoniacs, people who were mad out of their minds, and now they're of sound mind and at peace with themselves. They'd seen all that, and even more than that, they'd seen him raise people from the dead. They'd seen him raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, the widow of Nain's son, Lazarus. They'd seen him raise people from the dead. But somehow, somehow, the religious leaders had an overpowering need to be right. And the government leaders had an overpowering need to protect their reputations and to assert their authority. And that clouded everything. It blinded them. And it gave them a viewpoint, a crazy viewpoint as we need it now, that the, that the incredible works of love that Jesus brought as he displayed the glory of God to the world were a threat. They were a threat to their religious and political authority. And it resulted in them crucifying Jesus Christ. And here's a big warning for all of us this morning. Be wary of your need to be right. Because it may result in the crucifixion of someone you desperately need to have a relationship with. Jesus bore it all with forgiveness on his lips. And again, there were two criminals that were crucified with Jesus. And one of the criminals, he just abused Jesus just like the crowd does. And he, and he scorns him and you know, he, and, and, he, and he ridicules Jesus. But the other one, he pleads for mercy. Lord, please remember me. And Jesus came to this man. And you know, that man had no time to make any amends for his life. He had no time to make any retribution, any way to earn his forgiveness. He had absolutely no way to do that. And yet Jesus says today, you're going to be with me and welcome them in the kingdom with complete forgiveness. You say, well, how, how, how did Jesus do that? How can he do that? Like in the middle of those situations where he's hanging on the cross and people are in the middle of abusing him physically, verbally, in every way. And, and this, these people, you know, he's hanging on the cross and you've got these people asking for help and he needs it to. From people who asked him and from people who didn't ask him comes out. Forgiveness. How? How did that happen? You see, with Jesus, forgiveness was not circumstantial. Even when circumstances dictated that he should do the opposite, without missing a beat, Jesus always forgave. 
It was not that he withheld forgiveness. He says, okay, let's weigh up the degree of sin here. Let's see how bad this is and see if they're worthy of my forgiveness or not. You know, right in the middle of abuse, in the middle of excruciating pain inflicted by perpetrators of violence that were violent against him, he says, Father, forgive them. That's beyond incredible to me. And it's impossible apart from the divine. It's impossible unless it was the default outflow of his heart. You see, it was his predisposition, it was his default to forgive. He could never have done it if he waited a minute to assess the situation to see whether he's going to forgive or not, like we do. But it just kind of came out. And it, it behoves us as Christ's followers to do the same, to ask the Holy Spirit to enable us to have a predisposition towards forgiveness, a default towards forgiveness, to settle the matter in our hearts even before it arises. To settle the matter in our hearts even before it arises. To have our minds and thoughts and our, our prayers, our attitude, and everything about us, our ability to bless people, preconditioned by the mercy and the forgiveness of Christ bring a covering of forgiveness. That's what it means to forgive as Christ has forgiven us, doesn't it? It was a default response. We see this all the way through his life. In Mark chapter 2, one of the very first miracles, you remember that, is that when he healed the paralytic man. So this guy's got some friends, and he's paralyzed, and so they let him down through the roof, and there he is, Jesus in a crowd of people inside the home. And they're all listening, expecting to see what Jesus is going to do. And it's obvious the guy needs healed, right? He's paralyzed. He's on a stretcher. He's being lowered down. And you know, without skipping a beat, without any hesitation, Jesus' first words before they asked him to do anything, before the guy asked him, he said, listen, my son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And so his default response of Jesus' heart, it was his predisposition. It was like, whoa, it just flows out as an eager aggressiveness to dole out forgiveness. And that's what it means to characterize us. He did the same in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 is a story of a, a sinful woman, an adulterous lady. And she came into the Pharisee's house and she breaks a very expensive box of ointment all over Jesus. And apparently it's like three months of wages it took to buy this thing. And so she comes, but she's totally so thankful to Jesus Christ for what he means to her that he, she just pours this out. She doesn't care. Unabashed before all these people that were watching, she just says, no, I'm going to worship him. And of course, inevitably, inevitably, there were those whose default was the need to be right. And so the Pharisees, they came with suspicion, they came with judgment, they came with criticism. And in essence, they were unforgiving. But the Lord's heart, he moved towards her in mercy. He defended her act of love. He summed it up like this. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Wow, Jesus Christ links the whole idea of love and forgiveness. Jesus was, was clearly saying that he who has been forgiven much will love much, but he who has been forgiven little will love little. So this woman, she was a sinful woman. She deserved judgment. You know, she had done a lot of things that were not right in her life, but she met love first. And she was overwhelmed by the love of Jesus, the unfailing love of Jesus. She came full face with his forgiveness. And so she loved much. The Pharisees didn't understand the love of God. They didn't understand how they were just the same and needed the forgiveness of God when they were unable to. So, friends, the level at which we appreciate our own forgiveness on the screen, the level at which we appreciate our own forgiveness will reflect on our ability to love and forgive others.
And if we have a hard time forgiving others, perhaps we've never understood our own forgiveness. But Jesus is an incredible example for us to follow, but to our shame, to my shame, most of the time I'm just like the Pharisees. I'm judgmental, I'm ungrateful, I'm entitled by my own sense of self-righteousness. And you see, we all want Jesus to treat us the same way as he treated the adulterous lady, right? But how ironic it is that often we are unwilling to treat other people the same way that Jesus has treated us. And you may wonder how it is that Jesus can simply forgive. How can he just forgive? You know, this immoral woman and, and a criminal on the cross and, and the people who are in the middle of abusing him. How can he just forgive? I mean, these are bad people. That doesn't seem right. Well, I want to ask you, you this question this morning. Do you deserve God's forgiveness more than they do? Do you forgive, do you, do you deserve the forgiveness of God more than this immoral woman or the criminal on the cross or these people? Do you deserve it more? And if we do think we deserve it more, that's a complete error of judgment and a complete misunderstanding of all of our positions before God and the potential of all of us to sin and rebel before him. We're all actually exactly like these two women. And our tendency is to weigh up every interaction, every response, every performance, every action of other people on our scale of worthiness and choose to either withhold or deliver forgiveness. I want to say to you, that's a very tiresome way to live. That's a very tiresome way to live. What we're doing is choosing to hold on to anger. Because anger is the result of unforgiveness. And we do it because we think we're self-righteous. Oh, we're right, you know. Well, I want to tell you, it's a very tiresome way to live. What we need is a complete understanding and appreciation of our own forgiveness of Christ so that we have a default of forgiveness to other people. That is freedom. That is freedom. That is carrying a light burden. That is loving others as we should. I've just been reading this book called Unoffendable by Brian Hansen. I haven't read the whole book yet, but here's an, here's an incredible phrase I got out of it. Thinking we're entitled to keep anger in our laps, whether towards the sin of a political figure, a news network, your dumb neighbor, your lying spouse. He's kind of getting close to home, isn't he? Right? Your dumb neighbor, your lying spouse, your deceased father, whomever. It's perfectly natural and perfectly foolish. Make no mistake, foolishness destroys being offended is a tiring business. Letting things go gives you energy. Now, forgiveness does not mean deliberately seeking abuse of others so we can show how forgiving we are. But where there is potential for offense, which happens all the time, every day, right? We need to let go of our claim to be resentful and let go of our anger. You know, the wisdom writers, Solomon, who wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, incredible books, they basically compare wisdom and foolishness. I mean, which side would you like to be on? Well, I tell you, anger is mentioned a lot, and it's always mentioned with foolishness. It's never, ever mentioned with wisdom. And James, the brother of Jesus, said, man's anger does not ever produce the righteousness of God. Ever. And so our job is to dispel anger and bring a covering of forgiveness. And when we pray this prayer, Jesus will help us. Not to weigh up the pros and cons of actions, but to bring a covering of forgiveness. That's my default. That's my default. You know, man's inherent sin requires this of us. You know, there's a theological term called inherent sin. It means we're all sinners. We're all, we all need the forgiveness of God. And because of man's inherent sin, every performance, every interaction is completely imperfect. Why? Because of inherent sin. But because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus and the perfect righteousness that, that Jesus brings to the equation and gives to us, we are covered. We are covered by that. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're covered by the righteousness of Christ. And it doesn't matter what our degree of imperfection is. We are covered by it. We're all covered by the righteousness of Christ, and that necessitates that we, too, bring a covering of forgiveness.
We bring a covering of forgiveness. And so when people don't meet our expectations, we forgive because it just flows. It just flows. We decided already beforehand. It's just going to be there. Our hearts are preconditioned by the love and forgiveness of God. We understand that completely. We're so thankful. Our hearts are just flowing. We're just flowing with forgiveness. When things don't work right for us, we forgive. When we mess up, we forgive. I know the hardest person to forgive is yourself. I know that with me. With me, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. You can get you so depressed if you don't forgive yourself. Well, when you mess up, understand Christ's righteousness covers you as well. Just forgive yourself. Release it. Let it go. And so as I close up this morning, I wanted to tell you three things that are absolutely crucial about forgiveness. One, forgiveness brings ultimate victory. You see, the Lord Jesus was not defeated. He was the ultimate victor through forgiveness. And we move from victimhood to, to victory through forgiveness. You see, being a victim is allowing other people's behavior and decisions to affect your mood and behavior and conditioning it to the point that you respond in a, in a certain way. All right? But to move to victory is to bring it and just have it covered with forgiveness. And that is exactly what Jesus did, where you are not responding and you will not allow some other person's decisions, actions, or behavior to control your mood and behavior and your responses. That's victimhood. We need to move to victory where we're not controlled by other people's actions and behavior. We are controlled by the love of Christ that is in us, whereby we have complete forgiveness. We have the righteousness of Christ. And we, as a matter of default, the Christian who has been forgiven will have an automatic default response of forgiveness. We bring a covering of forgiveness. That is victory. And then the second thing is, this is the backbone of God's kingdom. This is not a side issue. This is not an optional extra. You know, this is not like, maybe think about this or not. No, it's right in the middle of the kingdom prayer. It starts with the kingdom, ends with the kingdom, right in the middle of forgiveness. It's, it's the backbone of the kingdom. It's the way his kingdom is won, the beauty and wonder of forgiveness. It's the reason that we're here today is because Jesus illustrated it to us the very heart and nature of God is forgiveness. And that has changed the world. And so it should be our backbone too. It should be. Hmm. An eager aggressiveness to go out to forgiveness is the default response of my heart. And the third thing I want you to take home is it's possible. It's possible to do this. You know, when I think about it, I often think it's impossible. But, but how, how is it possible for Christ to forgive in the middle of the worst betrayal of all time? I think 1 Corinthians 13 gives us the clue. And this is a summary. You know, these are, these are the, uh, the words that we, we say at the weddings. You know, we love to say them and we, oh, this is so nice. You know, love bears all things. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails until a few years later we hate each other, you know, and nobody follows what it says. It says love bears all things. Hmm. No categories. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love will fail where there's no forgiveness. Uh, we were here on Wednesday night. We celebrated Dwight and Julie's 48th anniversary. Where are they? Are they here today? Oh, man, there they are. I can, I can bet my bottom dollar that forgiveness was very prevalent through those 48 years. She said amen. Wow, that's about the loudest amen I ever heard. All right, to love perfectly is to live with a chronic outflow of forgiveness. Wow. It's the default response to other people's inconsistencies, their arrogance, and even the violent betrayal of men, and that's what Jesus showed us. He showed up as an eager aggressiveness to forgive. But John, it's too hard. 
Is it possible for us? You see, anger, unforgiveness is, is very easy. Because it's our default setting. It is. And it's our default setting because of the sin that is within us, the inherent sin that is still there. Love is very difficult. Forgiveness is very difficult. But, and it is a miracle. Love is a miracle. But it's possible. It's possible. With God, all things are possible. And this is possible. And he wants us to love. And he asks us to love. And he showed us how to love through Jesus. He's demonstrated over and over again. And so what are we to do? We're to have a default response of forgiveness. Now, this is not a message of shame. Where are you all going to go home and think, oh boy, we're, we're not cutting it. Oh man. No, this is an invitation to a victorious lifestyle. You know, and, and I want to get there. And, you know, whenever you prepare a sermon, the Lord tests you. And I think just like this week, it's been so many tests of this. You know, and even arising in my mind from things that happened 30 years ago. That is sitting there, a little block of unforgiveness in my heart. Oh, man. So how is it possible that we can move past this? Well, I think, I think Paul tells us, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, and I want you to take on this verse today. It says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And remember, love and forgiveness go hand in hand. They can't go. They can't be separated. You can't have love and unforgiveness. It's love, which is forgiveness, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's done. That's not, it maybe it's going to happen. No, it's happened. God's love has been poured. It is there. All we need to do is to let it flow. And the reason it doesn't flow is because we're blocking it with unforgiveness. It needs to flow. We need to remove the blockage of unforgiveness. May the default of our heart be to forgive, not to weigh up all the actions and to exert my insatiable desire to look like, to look right or to be right or to protect my, my reputation or whatever. Now, I'm not saying we don't stand and speak for the truth of Christ. Absolutely. We stand, we speak the truth of God, but Paul says we speak the truth in what? In, in love. In love! So even when we're speaking the truth of God, and Jesus did that himself, he was full of grace and truth. It was incredible the way Jesus demonstrated this. But we do it in love with forgiveness as our default. So that comes across with an attitude of humility and an attitude of acceptance of the other people, not rejecting the other person, but accepting them with warmth. Because if we come ac across the people and de declaring our truth without love and with an unforgiving attitude, we come across as arrogant, self-righteous, better than you are. I mean, look at you, how terrible you are. Look how good we are. You know? And we leave vengeance to the Lord. You know why we leave vengeance to the Lord? Because he's God. He's God. You're not. He says, leave vengeance to the Lord. Our responsibility is to, is to have a default of forgiveness. It flows out of our hearts. That is the backbone of the kingdom. And it's the glue that binds us together in the body of Christ as the children of God. And it is the absolute key to be totally in sync with your heavenly Father. So won't you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe today your relationships are not working. Maybe you don't feel loved by God. Maybe you think, uh, you know, God and you are not working very well together and you don't seem to be able to get very far and you can't discover his will and all those things. I don't know where you are today, but he wants you to move past that. He wants you to be in sync with him and perhaps this is the message that you needed to hear today. And so pray this prayer with me from a different perspective as we close today. Just repeat after me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread. 
and forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.